This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. So I'm sure you realize all our speakers have very distinct and distinguished careers, but I'm keeping our introduction short so we can hear from them. He's a professor and director of the Breast Cancer Research Lab at the Fox Chase Center and also adjunct professor of pathology and cell biology at Jefferson Medical School in Philadelphia. He was the director of one of our first research sites and is now a co-PI in one of the windows of susceptibilities. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here among all of you. Uh, this uh, diagram uh, represents a, a lifespan of the rat and also in the human, and also this depicts uh, certain areas that describe the window susceptibility, a concept that we developed and published in 1975. And you see here in the, in the rat that there is a, a red area that is the highest susceptibility window, that is when the animals are going from 35 to 55 60 days of age. That in human, of course, they have a different concept that will be between 12 years of age to 24. And the thing that we found is that this area in the animal is when the animal is highly susceptible to develop breast cancer, especially in the rat, when it's inoculated either with the MBA or methyl nitrosuria. But also this is interesting to observe that they, when the animal gets older, the susceptibility decrease is in the pink line over here. And then another important element that if you induce pregnancy in the area of high susceptibility, that is the green area, the animal don't develop breast cancer and this protection that is conferring the animal for one pregnancy and one lactation stay forever in the lifespan of the animal. And also there is a yellow area that is the, uh, the, the prenatal period of the animal, that when the animal is exposed to different environmental agents, also change the susceptibility to develop carcinoma. And the interesting part is that the same kind of pattern that we see in the animal, we see in human, that there is a window of susceptibility during the, around the pubertal area that have been demonstrated by the work of McGregor when, we, he, when he showed that girls that were between 10 to 14, even 19 years of age, and they were under the atomic, bomb, atomic bombing in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, are the ones that develop later on more breast cancer. And this is the reason why this specific area is important in our study. But when a woman has an early pregnancy, before 24 years of age, they are conferred a full protection that lasts for life. That is very important. And I will concentrate only in this specific area in the lifespan of the woman in which a woman has an early first full-term pregnancy. Now, and this is, a, a, this is very well demonstrated in the literature. I have been also, also alluded by the, my, the previous speaker. The early parity, first child born from early teens to middle and 20s, have a significant protective effect breastfeeding, multiparity in early part of women, and each additional birth confer greater protection. Therefore, the question that we need to address ourselves is why pregnancy produce protection against breast cancer? And everything started in 1972 in our life. Uh, we were doing an experiment in the rat in which we are inducing pregnancy and then giving to the animal a carcinogenic agent. And Irma came to me and said, listen, I, we see here in the mammary gland of this animal something strange. In the nulipar women, we see this kind of terminal embed structure. But when the animal has going through a, a pregnancy and lactation, we never see this terminal embed structure. We observe a structure like this one that are lobular one. 
And that was a very important observation because indicated that during the process of protection, you eliminate the terminal end bud and produce some kind of permanent refractoriness to carcinogenesis. And the important thing that we demonstrate from there is that even after pregnancy and lactation is over, the animal involved, but they never go back to the terminal and bad structure in the rat. They never go back to the terminal and bad structure in the older animals. Now, this uh, observation really put us in another kind of mood. What happened in human? How to study that in human? And in human, the situation is completely different. We have not only a laminar mammary gland, but a, a three-dimensional structures. And then the thing that we got a grant from the NCI for five years to study how the different structure in the mammary gland look in a three-dimensional configuration and how really they evolve during the period of life of a woman. And we get a mid slicer and start cutting 300 full braids that were obtained from different means. And we, uh, uh, those braids we are defatted, and we, we are cut it, and we stain it with toluidine blue. You see here in the, in, over there in the uh, mounted in a slide, and then mounted here in a, a glass, in a, in a plastic bag. And those structures show clearly the fibrous tissue containing the lobular structure of the mammary gland. And the thing that we found is that during the period that we studied from breast tissue obtained from 14 years of age, that is the earliest a tissue that we got, until 64 years of age, we observed that the mammary gland will go through the process of differentiation that was from the terminal structure that we found in the early ages, then this structure developed to alveolar bud, and from the alveolar bud that developed the lobular type one, that is the, ter the typical terminal ductal lobular structure that was described by, uh, by the old anatomist many years in 1930. And from the lobular type one, when the woman start getting uh, the, the, uh, uh, the menstrual cycle, they develop lobular type two, and then when the woman get pregnant, they develop the lobular type three. And you see here that it's a very clear difference between the terminal ductal structure of the lobulus type 1 to the lobulus type 2 and 3. The lobulus type 3 is the more differentiated structure that even acquires more differentiation during lactation, and then we call lobulus type 4. But the interesting part is that when we put these structures in the lifespan of a woman, we found that the lobulus type 1 were very low, very high in the animals, excuse me, in the women that um, are the very young women, and then when the women get pregnant, when we see the, the parity history of these uh, women, we found that the lobulus type 1 decreased, and then they start increasing the lobulus type 3. And the lobulus type 3 remain very high until the fourth, third, fourth decade of life, and they start decreasing in blue line. And then they disappear at, mon at menopause when the woman get 50, 55, or 64 years of age, the lobulus type 3 have practically disappeared, and the only structure that really remains is the lobulus type 1, meaning that the, the woman differentiate the structure from lobulus type 1 to lobulus type 2, 3, and 4 during the process of pregnancy. Instead, we found that the nulipar women, they never get this process of differentiation. Most of these nulipar women have only lobulus type 1 and lobulus type 2, but they never get lobulus type 3. Occasionally, we saw some lobulus type 3 in the nulipar women. That allow us to conclude that during the nulipar women, they go from lobulus type 1 to lobulus type 2, rarely to lobulus type 3, and they, in the involution, they go back to lobulus type 1. Instead, in the power of women, they go from lobulus type 1 two, three, four in lactation, and then start regression, pole lactation and regression, and then still until the third or fourth decade of life, you see in these women lobulus type three and lobulus type two, and then in, in the menopause, you see only lobulus type one. Meaning that we, this pivotal observation that was published in 1992, almost 20 years ago, demonstrated that nuliparos and power women have a different developmental pattern of development that the nulipar women never go through the process of differentiation, where the power of women go through the process of differentiation, and then at menopause, they look exactly the same one that nuliparus, but they are refractory to carcinogenesis. Therefore, that was our main question that we posed to ourselves, and our working hypothesis was the following. 
The breast of parus postmenopausal women exhibit a specific genomic signature that has been induced by a full-term pregnancy during the hormonal protection window, meaning that this event that takes place when the woman was young that really produce some kind of marker, a fingerprint, or a signature that remain in the postmenopausal women. The same effect doesn't occur in the nuripara women because they have having ongoing through the process of differentiation. And this genomic signature controls cell differentiation that lead to breast cancer prevention. Now, how to demonstrate this in human was not an easy task, because collecting normal tissue from women is difficult. And was a period in we got the collaboration with Dr. Paolo Toniolo that he has a cohort of women in Sweden, and we made a consortium between the university a New York University in which Paolo Toniolo was directing that part of the study, and people in Sweden from the University of Umea and Fox Shea Cancer Center. And uh, we were able to obtain volunteer residents of Lulea, Sweden, this area of Sweden, and uh, we performed a, a, the first study that lasted from 2008 to 2010, studying postmenopausal women aged 50 to 69 years of age. Um, the data of this result have been published in Cancer Prevention Research in 2011 and Medical Genomic in 2012. Now, and we are already ongoing to another study that is studying premenopausal women, in which we really want to see if the same pattern that we observe in the postmenopausal hold in this group of women. But the important thing that we found here is that we obtained from these women, postmenopausal women, core biopsy, find needle core biopsy, and that allow us to obtain really a, a approximate cylinder of one centimeter per 1.5 millimeter in diameter that allow to have the lobular structure, specifically lobulus type one, with the surrounding stroma and adipose tissue. And that is the way that look the core biopsy. And from those core biopsies, we separate the RNA and we made a symmetric study. And what we found? We found that when we put all the data together, the parus women are the ones to your left, to your right, in which they find that there are significantly uh, upregulated genes in red. And in the newly parus women, we found that in green, all the downregulated genes. And in the lower portion, you see the unregulated, the downregulated gene in the parus that are upregulated in the newly parus. Meaning that we found a signature in those women that were related to the expression of a specific gene controlled RNA metabolisms and RNA splicing. And among the downregulated genes, the most important one was the insulin growth factor one. Now, this allows us to uh, go to the second question. Why certain women that have an early full term pregnancy still develop breast cancer? And are the part of women with breast cancer different from those that do not develop breast cancer? And this data have been published a little earlier in 2008 in Cancer Epidemiology and Biomarker. And the thing that we have done is a case control study uh, in which we took women that were nuliparus and parus with breast cancer and nuliparus and parus without breast cancer. And we studied the normal tissue of this material. And what we found? We found that the, when we compare the genomic, approach, the genomic profile of the nuliparus without cancer, we are very similar to the, the nuliparus with cancer. And when we compare this with the parus with cancer, we are very similar. But when we compare with the parus without cancer, we are different. We was around 200 uh, genes, around 200 genes, that were significantly different between these two groups, that are more or less the same number of genes that we identify in the study that we perform with the uh, people in Lulea using postmenopausal women. Mean that we conclude from this that the first full-term pregnancy induces a specific genomic signature that can be detected in the postmenopausal breast. And an event that took place in this moment in the lifespan of a woman in the time that also is a high window of susceptibility, because we know by epidemiological study that that area, when it's affected by a carcinogenic agent that women develop more breast cancer, when a first pregnancy takes place, a full-term pregnancy takes place, that protection conferred lasts for the whole lifespan of that, uh, day of that woman. And we found that this 
women contain a specific genomic signature. Now, the next question is, what is the meaning of the genomic signature of pregnancy? How does the genomic signature of pregnancy works? And as I just indicated to you, most of the part of women contain upregulation of, of genes that are regulated to the RNA metabolisms and RNA splicing. And everybody knows in this audience what RNA is splicing. But basically, is when the RNA is synthesized, a different portion of the RNA are cut and put together in order to determine the final RNA mes mes messenger that will produce the protein, a specific protein. And all the genes that are controlling this process are significantly upregulated in the part of women. And the most important element that we identify is that most of these genes are identified in a specific compartment of the nucleus that is the speckle. And the speckle also has a specific marker that is the CCNL2, that is a cycling that when we perform immunocytochemistry, we found that highly bright in the parus epithelium. Meaning that women that have an early full term pregnancy contain a significant regulation of the splicing mechanism that really produce this specific difference between these two groups. And the biological importance of the differential expression of genes that regulate the splicing is because that provides some kind of a security system. It's like to have a security system in the door of your house, another security system inside of your house that doesn't allow any intruder to come meaning that the fact that you can control the splicing mechanism will allow the cell to produce better protein and that not anomaly or no mutated protein is formed. Uh, this is an area that we are currently studying in order to understand a little better this. But it was published in medical genomic. But another interesting thing that we observe is that when you observe the breast epithelium of the postmenopausal women that, have it, that are nulliparous, and when you compare that with the part of women, the part of women contain nuclei that are more heterochromatic than the one that you see in the nulipar of women. I don't know if I can show you, but it's clearly seen here that they, in the nulipar of women, they have a more round, more clear nuclei with less chromatin. That's called euchromatin. And when you see they are in the, in the middle, in the parus, you see that the nuclei of these cells are more smaller, more dense and contain more dense chromatin. And also in the lower panel, in order to show that the, the basal cells that are positive for keratin 5 and 6 and the myoepithelial cells are not involved in this process. Only the epithelial component, the luminal cell component, are the ones that are involved in this process. Meaning that what we observe here is that during the process of pregnancy and lactation obtained during the first early full-term pregnancy in the postmenopausal women, we observe that there is a significant increase in the number of cells that are heterochromatic, meaning that there are condensation of the chromatin, meaning that has been the phenomenon that is going through that terminology is some kind of a reorganization of the chromatin. And we observe in the part of women decrease in the number of euchromatic cells. Now, the meaning of chromatin condensation indicates that they limit the ability of the RNA polymerase, polymerase II transcription complex to assess DNA, resulting in reduced missing RNA protein output, meaning that what that basically means is that it's a silence of the genome in order that the cell don't produce a specific protein. Um, we demonstrated that because when you reacted the, the nuriparus and parus breast tissue with a histone 3 methylated lysine 9, there is a significant increase in reactivity and in the number of cell positive in the parus versus the nulliparus. And the same thing happened with lysine 27. In the upper panel is the nulliparus breast, in the lower panel the parus breast, and you see that is a significant intensity in the reaction. Now, this allows us to postulate that what happened during the parity is that have been changing the uh, number of uh, heterochromatic cells due to methylation of the histones. Now, when we start looking again the, uh, the, 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 the gene that has been identified, we identify other genes that also have been regulating the parity. And most of these genes resulted to be long non-coding regions like XIT, MALAD1, and NID1 that are summarized in this slide. And you see that in the lower portion, there are three long non-coding regions like XIT, NID1, and MALAD1 
that are up-regulated, significantly regulated in the part of women, that are not in the newly part of women, together with other, like SH22, that is enhanced or SETA homologous, that belong to the polygon, and also other chromatin binding uh, protein like the CBX3 and CHD22. And in the nuliparos, instead, we found that there are up uh, the, the SOC6 and SOC17 that are downregulating the, in the parus are upregulating uh, up the nuliparos women. And you hold a minute, I try to explain this much better. Meaning that we found that the long non coding region that are associated with the process of methylation because they long non-coding regions uh, associate with some methyl transferase among them the SH2 and then allow the methylation of the histona or the methylation of certain specific genes. Meaning that the polycon group that is together with the long coding region is inhibiting the expression of specific genes is expressed in this cell by the ESH2 and together with the long non-coding region produce a binding that really produce some kind of repression of the expression of specific uh, protein in this. Uh, in the, the tree thorax that is facilitating the, um, together with the non coding the transcription is not expressed in the parus or only parus women. And XIT is a very important long non coding region that is upregulated uh, up in the nuliparous women and is maintained and regulated because there is, is in association with SOC6 and SOC17. And instead, in the parus breast, XIT is significantly upregulated and we lost the other two repressors like SOC6 and SOC17. The binding of the long non coding region to the polymerase 2 and the association with the uh, ESH2 type member of the polycon produce this kind of picture in which there is methylation of all these portions of the chromatin that produce the heterochromatin pattern that, was, that you see here in the parous women. Now, the meaning that what we observe here, there is a significant downregulation of specific genes and upregulation of other genes, and among them is the genes that are controlling the silence of the chromatin through the polycon system. Now, how to induce genomic signature without fearful term pregnancy. And we found that ACG is one of the first hormones that is produced in the embryo, in the placenta. And uh, there is a in literature demonstration that placenta, the, the ACG or chronic guaranotrophin is significantly regulated in women that have less breast cancer. And that is done by Toniolo's group. Now, when we use this model, that is the DNA-induced mammary tumors, and we treat the animal with different hormones, like progesterone and estrogens and well ACG, we found that ACG produced a significant protection against mammary carcinogenesis. And you see here in the column in, in white, a 100 international unit given to the animal for 21 days with significant protection. But also we observed that when we take 10F cell that was developed in our, in our laboratory when we were in the Michigan Cancer Foundation, that when you put in collagen produce a normal ductal structure, when you treat with the ACG, they produce significant number of branching and secondary and tertiary branching meaning differentiation. And when you react the, this cell with lysine 4, they are very active in the control and it's very downregulated in the ACG treated and it's a regulation to lysine 27. And we observe that demonstrating uh, that XIT is also regulated by the ACG and SH2 is also regulated by that, demonstrating that with the same phenomena that we are observing in vivo in the part of women, we can induce an in vitro system producing uh, some kind of transcription and inactivation. I will hold a minute. Yeah. Now, we believe that we can develop a personalized genomic signature, and this is an intermediate endpoint for evaluating the degree of mammary gland differentiation. And we can determine if which woman parity has been protected. And this is very important because up to now, all the preventive strategies that exist, like tamoxifen or raloxifen, you need to give 50 women, women the treatment in order that one of them respond. Now we know which woman the parity is protective because they have developed a specific genomic signature. And also, to, uh, this could be a biomarker for evaluating other preventive agents meaning that the puberty is the high susceptibility window that we found in animals, in the rat specifically, we didn't study the mouse, and in human. But when you induce pregnancy in this specific window, you produce uh, protection. And we are, we are going, uh, what is the next step that we have in our mind? 
I think that in working in collaboration with the Toniolos group uh, and the people in Sweden, uh, we would like to transform the brace genomic signature to a blood signature of prevention. Uh, we also would like to simplify the hormonal treatment with ACG by using a small peptide that we are doing that with a grant from the Common Foundation, and to target the preventive strategies in young women during the window susceptibility, meaning that this peptide can be administered very easily by nasal spray or other means in order to produce the signature that we already know that is preventive. And the take home message for all of you is that there is a window susceptibility that allows a biological intervention. And early fair full term pregnancy elicits the specific genomic signature prevention, and this genomic signature can be manipulated exogenous by using a specific hormones that can control the molecular mechanisms that have indicated previously. And I would like to thank all my team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.